My name is Ed Piskor. I am Jim Rugg. And we are here for Wizard Magazine number 42, February 1995. Happy birthday, 18-year-old Jim Rugg. That is right. Open it up, man, with a... Is it a bifold or a trifold cover, Jimmy? <laughs> I don't know, Ed. <laughs> I call it a trifold. It's it's three panels. How about that? Yeah, a triptych. Triptych. There you go. <laughs> of Alex Ross painting uh, all these future movie stars. Yes, that's exactly what it looks like. <laughs> the, uh, you know, famous photo referencer, uh, Alex Ross. Uh, I look at the Iceman and just imagine a guy, like, wearing basically the stunt outfit whenever in the first uh, Nightmare on Elm Street when I put Freddy on fire. <laughs> yes. When you see that in HD, you see this guy with, like, all these towels and shit on his head. Because that's what that looks like. Laundry man. Asbestos suit. <laughs> Yeah, his style would work better on some characters than others, I think. Yeah, this uh this um Doctor Strange isn't too cool. Like like as long as you don't see like the eyes, man, like uh, it all works. His Spider Man I think is super cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, That's a great like, the fabric Spider-Man. and stuff. Because you would see like Lucho masks would have that like same uh drapery. It's funny. This is definitely the issue that, that I'm I'm out on Wizard. I don't know that I buy a wizard past this issue. And uh I realized, like, I quit Wizard and the Comics Journal based on Alex Ross features. Interesting. We got to do that Alex Ross piece, man, from uh, Comics Journal, because I don't know the one that you speak of. I might be out of it, because it's a two-issue piece, and I had a subscription at the time, and I was furious. That it was two issues of 12? two issues of Alex Ross declaring capital A art because of his pure love of superheroes elevating it to that status. For two issues. <laughs> That's more, I suppose, a beef with Gary Groth than with uh, Garib Shameless, but uh, yes. <laughs> so let's get into this. Oh, go back, Ed. Yeah. This Leonard Nimoy primordial ad. Worst art ever? Pretty bad. Like, I, I am critical of this techno comic stuff, and they're getting a lot more attention than I remember them getting, and certainly more than I think they should. Yeah. This is some of the worst art I have seen in Wizard Magazine who greenlights this as an ad? Did they have a saboteur working for them that was trying to sink their company? Why would anybody on earth ever put this out if you were trying to sell books? That looks like people that are blind publishing comics because that is, <laughs> I it can't be the, it can't, it has to be the worst art they ever published, right? <laughs> like imagine if you're putting your ad out, your best foot forward. This is the one thing people are going to see and this is what you pick. <laughs> I have two issues of Primordials, and <laughs> they're even worse than this, man. So, so this is, like, as good as it got, man. Pull anything for the editorial piece, man, Pat McCollum? No more Shameless. <laughs> Yay! I'm jumping up and down over here. But again, be careful what you wish for. We'll see how this plays out. This is new territory for me. Brace yourself with just uh, this one image of Fairchild's head. On crumpled paper. <laughs> yeah. A lot of faux effects going on in that image. Yes. How about the letters, Jimmy? I didn't pull anything. Poison, Elf, Poison Elves gets uh, a little bit of shine in the letters, and it made me think Poison Elves has been mentioned 20 times in Wizard Magazine up to this point. I don't know if Caliber has been mentioned once, and when you think of everything that is covered in Wizard, I've been shocked by how much stuff... Boneyard Press is practically Image Comics, the way it's covered in, in Wizard... Why no Caliber? Yeah. Caliber is a huge publisher, relatively speaking. They certainly publish more than all the Poison Elves issues put together, all the Boneyard Press output. Like They're around for years and years and years, and they're not mentioned at all in Wizard Magazine, and it makes me wonder like, why that is. Was there some kind of beef between Shameless and, and Caliber Press? Good point. They're conspicuous in their, in their absence. Yeah, good point. All right, Wizard News. Make mine Malibu. It's official. Uh, Malibu has been acquired by Marvel Comics. We've known this is coming. There have been rumors of this. And uh, it's it's another one of the questionable moves, in my opinion, that we have seen for the last couple of years coming out of Marvel Comics. One of the reasons cited here is Malibu's coloring is mentioned. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to explain that time period, but like coloring was a really big thing. Dark Horse had an in-staff in-house coloring staff that would run, I think, three shifts. I've talked to some people at Dark Horse about this because digital coloring was this thing that you sort of had to do post-image just to keep up so your books looked like they were up-to-date and, and that was kind of the look. 
but freelancers weren't going out and going from Doc Martin inks to like $5,000 hardware. Uh, you know, so a lot of these companies would have some sort of staff version, like Wildstorm had a big coloring staff. I, I, I guess, you know, it's weird to think that color, coloring department would be a reason you would purchase a, make a large acquisition, but it was something. And it's mentioned in this article. Valiant Gains' new image of Voyager Communications, the parent company of Valiant, is now uh, Acclaim Comics. And uh, there's going to be imprints, Valiant, Windjammer, and Armada. And a whole new slew of uh, creators are on board to, to make fresh stuff, man. Uh, Jurgens, Bart Sears is back after the ominous press <laughs> ominously goes away. Bray Fogle, who was doing Prime, Galacy. Jackson Geis, Ron Morris, Mike Manley, Andy Smith. I th- Go ahead. If you flip to the back cover of this issue, you'll see a preview of uh, some of these titles. I loved the Bray Fogle bloodshot. I thought it was one of the coolest versions of that character. I think that's a really cool image. That one's Bray Fogle art there. I think uh, that this Jurgens art is some of his, his best art that I've ever seen in, in from his output. Yeah, it's we've been seeing the house ads from Valiant that are trying to make it look like they are, there isn't a house style, and it feels like that's behind this this move. Like they're really trying to let everybody know our books have character and, and personality and, and unique styles from book to book. Um, this is probably the strongest demonstration of that. One of the big books that will come from this this weird kludge of Valiant imprints and whatnot will be uh, Quantum and Woody. Uh, that's that's going to be a, a popular book, like in the pages of Wizard Magazine moving forward. You named all of their imprints, like Windjammer and stuff. So it's a creator-owned imprint. There's a licensing imprint. There's the regular universe, which seems to be the, the template for all of these upstart publishers. And uh, their licensed book will be Magic the Gathering, which seems like a good license to have, but I don't remember it making much of a mark. Jim, in 1995, man, if you have a computer and you want to do some coloring, you could buy a program for home use called DS Designs Colorize 2.0 Software. I was taking a look online to try to see if I could find, like, uh, you know, some sort of uh, legacy copy of this, some sort of uh, graphical user interface. What would it look like? I can find nothing, not one mention on any of the trillion websites that exist on the internet. I can find nothing, but it can output into... uh, EPS, TIFF, or Photoshop files, which is interesting to me because I'm seeing this thing highlighted and I'm like, so Photoshop still isn't even a standard in 95 yet. Photoshop was not the standard. Like I mentioned, Dark Horse's in-house coloring department. They didn't use Photoshop initially. And I think, I, I'm going to say it was a Corel pro- product, but I could be wrong on that one too. Look, man, you know, people were trying to figure this out. Uh, It it was not a foregone conclusion that Photoshop was going to be it. I'm impressed that you could output as a Photoshop file format because a lot of software didn't have that capability ever, you know, let alone, uh, you know, at this time period when Photoshop would have been, I don't know, two or three, you know, like, like very early on in the Photoshop history. The Marvelution continues, man. From from last week's coverage, there's going to be a shakeup. There's going to be like you know four editorial kind of houses uh, within the House of Ideas. And Tom DeFalco, he's bouncing. Yes, yeah. And I mentioned him last last issue that he was the editor in chief virtually my entire time reading Marvel comics. Jim, I got to ask you, man, why are you holding Zen Comics? <laughs> Entity Comics mentions these uh, in the company updates, and to me, these are some of the best. Of the uh, of the Zen comics, this artist is Joel Orbetta, and that's who they're talking about in the company update. He is known as Lamour Supreme. Oh yeah, um, he's yeah. a he's a kayfaber man. So he's a I, I don't know what graffiti artist is. Is that how you would describe him? Yeah, sure. Um, does album covers, things of that nature, and he did a couple of issues of Zen, and so. I have one here in color and, and one in black and white. I like his art on this stuff. To me, this feels a little bit of that like outlaw '90s super rendering style. A lot of uh, a lot of detail, a lot of hatching, a lot of pen work, and uh, I don't think Zen ever looks better than than these couple of issues that Orbetta drew. Yeah, this is dope. That's pretty wild stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. And I, I like where his art has evolved, too. You should check out his uh, Instagram account. 
That's got a McFarlane vibe to it. Yeah, when I look at these, to me, it's like he could easily have stepped into image. Uh, he could have been an extreme artist, you know, done a McFarlane book, something like that, uh, after looking at these. But goes off in, instead into into other illustration styles. That's cool that he's still around, though. You know, in terms of, like, we know of him through the channel. Like, it's, it's cool that he's still around comics. This is interesting, man. Go Joe, but where? So there was a... Uh, preemptive press release put out into the universe however that was done in those 90s and whoever the heck would get those things man from uh, rob liefeld and extreme studios saying that could be a gi joe comic on the horizon and there were some competing uh people who were interested in that as well top cow productions uh were sort of in the running to try to get their hands on the on the gi joe license uh at this point nobody has it and this piece is here because like Hasbro and them, they they want they want you to know that nobody has this thing right now, man. We are not you know bought up yet. The license is still available, and in fact, we're in talks. And ultimately, who they're in talks with, it's going to be Dark Horse first. There's this like very shitty uh, four issue miniseries that's going to come out, man, with like a Frank Miller cover, that was just the only cool thing about it. Um, but then inevitably, there will be the Josh Blaylock. Devil's Due, uh, G.I. Joe, that'll happen in around 2000. Yeah, 2000, 2001. Yeah, it's it's surprising that that license is not developed for like five years, right? I mean, this is ninety early 95, so it's about five years with very minimal movement. I guess the Dark Horse <laughs> lack of success really kind of buries it for several years. Yeah. Dark Horse paints it black, man. A Spike Lee set of comics do you know anything about these no this is one i looked for i think the actual comics were called colors in black mm. is is the series yeah. name and i think it was maybe like four issues or so uh, but but i don't have any <laughs> back with your zen douchebag uh, <laughs> foolproof autographs and i'm not talking a little more supreme i'm talking steve stern the goofball who created that shit and, and tried to peddle us freaking hokum so he's going to be signing his comics from now on with a DNA pen. It has his fucking DNA in the ink or something, man. Some saliva or hair root is going to be in there, man. And they're promoting this pen. And he's very excited to be the first guy to have the DNA pen. So he is a schmuck and a lame and a punk through and through. And Patrick Daniel O'Neill writing this piece. Yeah. Come on, man. Not surprised. <laughs> I expect better <laughs> from him. Not surprised, man. Up and coming. Jim Calafiore... Uh, being highlighted on, I guess he's doing some some valiant stuff. Uh, he'll he'll go on to take over the uh, the Aquaman when Aquaman gets the harpoon gimmick That's on the right. wrist. Yeah, I remember that. But I know this guy from Camelot Eternal from Ca from Caliber Press, man. Very very raw style. And Bart Sears is going to go away on the uh, the art tutorials in here. Greg Capullo is going to do a couple. Adam Ward's going to do a couple, but I forgot, man. Jim Califiori's going to do a couple, too. Interesting. I like that EXO piece a lot. I think that's really cool. I even kind of like this ad. This reminds me a lot of the image art style. It's a it's a Fury, Nick Fury comic. Um, it makes me curious to flip through an issue. Like, if it looks like that, I feel like I should have enjoyed that at the time. Art imitates life, man. Artist Alex Ross on the success of Mar Marvel's Marvels. The end of the DC Universe and why Peter Parker is such a weasel, man. So you, at the beginning of this, you establish your giant um, Alex Ross fan. I don't, uh, I don't dislike Alex Ross. I don't particularly like any of his comics that I've read. Um, I don't think they work great as comics, the storytelling. And I was buying that stuff, but I just, like, panel to panel, I don't think it works. He's fine as an illustrator. I don't like this idea that just because, I don't know, you're an adult and love superheroes, that somehow elevates them. Um, I think he's a very good illustrator and certainly right place, right time. I mean, you can't argue with his success. There was a big show at the Andy Warhol featuring his art several years ago at the Andy Warhol Museum, I should say. And it was a great show, but he did comics like from childhood on and they had a bunch of his childhood comics on display great. there. They were fantastic. I even like a lot of his pencil drawings whenever you see those things show up sometimes on a cover or whatever. Yeah, we'll see them throughout Wizard as we continue the coverage and stuff. But he is a supernova. Um, this is probably the first, like, at least in comics coverage, the first stand up and, and take your bow. Because Marvel's 
Marvel's is the big Marvel comic of this of this era. He twenty four year old kid uh, doing these things, man, and uh, he had had a mother who was an illustrator, man. So I think I think you get to become an outlier, like when you have little bits of luck. That's what the Malcolm Gladwell tenants, man, and to have a mom who's a uh, who's an illustrator can sort of help along the way with certain things like the use of reference. I don't know about you when you were younger, man, but I thought that I was totally cheating. I liked the way my art looked whenever I would use reference material, but I felt like I was pulling a sham. I felt like I was not doing what I was supposed to. And I thought that the stuff that you saw on the comic page is supposed to come from like imagination. I didn't read interviews where that was it was acceptable to do that, and I felt like I was cheating. Um, to have a mom who would maybe sit that, sit me down and be like, no, Junior, it's quite okay to like, uh, you know, look at a building outside and draw that in your comic or something like that. That would have, that would have pushed me forward five years of where I was. It is weird the hangups that, that we get. I, I had a bunch of them, I think because of the swipe files feature in sure. Comics Journal where it was like, it was okay to reference some stuff, but not other stuff. Yeah. It's, we're our own worst enemies in all of these things. Yeah. Um, his father, you know, you, you say his mother was an illustrator. His father was a Protestant minister. So my background, my religious background is Protestant. Um, biblical storytelling was a big thing for me, and I see it in this stuff. Mm. You know, that that his approach to the purity of superheroes makes a lot more sense to me whenever I think of it filtered through an upbringing where religion and the Bible would have been important uh, in terms of storytelling. And I think it's really on display uh, with Marvels and probably in Kingdom Come as well. So he worked at an ad agency in Chicago to begin with as he was coming through. I have one more childhood note. Yeah, yeah. He had older siblings who also read comics. So at a very young age, he saw Zap yeah. and Les Daniels' comic, uh, comics book. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And we've heard you talk about, you know, both of those. Really, I've heard you talk about both of those as being an influence early on. So I thought that was pretty interesting as a, as a young man that he got hold of those things. For sure, for sure. So when he is at uh, the, the Art Institute of Chicago... Uh, do we know, like, how crazy would it be if he was at the same art school as, like, Chris Ware? I don't know if it's the same school that he goes to. Yeah, I don't think so either, because it, it's possible it could have even been, like, super, that would be super close years. <laughs> now that's my fantasy, is those two in the same class. <laughs> but uh, I, I, know you've, I know you've taken design courses and stuff. Um, when I was at the Kubert School, I went to uh, one of the students that I was there with did a full like four year tour of duty at like RISD and Rhode Island School of Design. Yeah. And the way that an illustrator was taught in the school system, uh, presentation was everything. If you if you watch uh, Mad Men and they show examples of like the, the, the art that will be going forthcoming for like print ads and stuff. We're talking uh, intensely referenced material, meticulous, not one pencil line out of order, um, and up to the presentation of just like, for every piece of artboard you use, you better have an equally sized piece of tracing paper to like tape on top of it to keep this thing pristine. And and he came up through a system like that at the school, plus probably seeing the stuff that his mom has to do to... The art isn't enough. It's like the meticulous presentation that will get you a $5 million uh, campaign with Colgate or something. Um, he was stoked that like when he got into the workforce that the company that he was working for, for story, doing storyboards and stuff, they still kept all of that energy of like um, photo referencing to death. Like you would see storyboards that are dashed out wherever he worked. They didn't do that, man. Total photo reference stuff. And, um, and he, he, he liked that practice. You and I, we have friends who, uh, who when they do their comics, uh, it's like, yo, man, ha haven't you drawn a hand like 5,000 times? Like, why do you still have to like, like pull photos for hands, for hands and stuff? This guy is just down with that. He says it taught him domestic realism, the storyboards. And I think you see that totally in Marvels. Yeah. And, yeah. and and that's a hard thing to pull off. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a reason that he, you know, this is lightning in a bottle and that he just took off like a rocket was strapped to him. This stuff resonates. It's easy to understand, you know, why that would make sense. In a lot of ways, you know, we've talked about Wizard pushing towards movies and things. He is a bridge to that. 
You know, like, these are the movies before we got the CGI movies of the 2000s. He kind of delivered that. And it was like, it was the perfect thing for this audience. And the way that Dark Knight and Watchmen was the perfect 80s book, Marvel's was the perfect 90s book. Because now you're an adult and this is nostalgia. You know, that Marvel series, it ends with the death of Gwen Stacy. We were just in Charlotte uh, this fall talking to Shelton Drum, the, the proprietor of Heroes Aren't Hard to Find. Great comics historian, collector, you know, comics advocate. And we were talking to him about the comics he loves. And he cited the death of Gwen Stacy as being the moment when Spider-Man really stops for him. Um, you know, so this is like plugged into both nostalgia, you know, these adult readers, but also giving them the what if it was real. <laughs> it, it all adds up like this is your bridge uh, that's going into what we now see in all of these giant CGI movies. So so he, uh, while at the uh, Chicago ad agency, one of his homeboys at the office, man, is doing now comics. And he, he likes comics, has always drawn comics, man, and took that portfolio over to now, showed it off, had the opportunity to do this Terminator comic, The Burning Earth, man. He asked those dudes over there at now, hey, man, can I paint it? They're like, whatever, kid. <laughs> Yeah, painting and comics was such a weird uh, transition for everybody. It was like a lot of comics really didn't know how to process that publishers. You hear stories of Bill Sienkiewicz with Electra Assassin, and he was just paid like colorist fees because they didn't really have a system set up for it. I tend to like Alex Ross's work more in this raw -er stage. Yeah. As he becomes more polished... Um, and we've said this about all kinds of different artists, it becomes less interesting to me as he sort of gets better. Um, I'm sure uh, his bank account, <laughs> it, it's inverse the way it works in terms of popularity and success. But for me, I like seeing kind of the, the rougher the rougher edges, seeing him form. Yeah, and, and, and the place that he's at now, remember Tiger Electronics, every single yeah, one man. of these are just <laughs> piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that. Those things stink. Um, where he's at now is in this very smart place. It's actually a similar place where uh, J. Scott Campbell, they're doing the same thing where, and I discovered this while working on X-Men Grand Design. Like, you can you can approach, you know, Sven over there at Marvel and say, I would like to make Spider-Man socks. And he'll go off and he'll come back to you with, like, a price. And, like, the, con the contracts will be drawn up. You could do that. So, Al knowing this, Alex Ross knows this, and that's a business he's in now is like doing these tchotchkes and stuff with like Alex Ross paintings on them. And it's like you just go over and talk to Sven, make a deal, sell a bunch of stuff, variant covers and whatnot. Do your own variant cover. Well, he's done Academy Award art, like, like you know, show art, broadcast art and stuff. So like he's in another echelon, too, in terms of commercial illustrator. Yeah. Uh, let's let's keep this thing rocking, man. Uh, I was astonished to discover that he when he was doing Marvel's. Uh, 12 pages a month, and I could do eight. So I can need to step something up. Man. It's a pretty good clip, for sure. He also said that he never uh, left the house while putting that together. And already at this point, he is working on Kingdom Come this this early, because it'll be uh, it's going to be two years before uh, Kingdom Come comes out, um, at least as per this. And... Uh, he does that at about a rate of uh, 10 pages per month, which is still better than the eight pages that I can do. It's a dedicated worker, no doubt. In order to get the Marvel's gig, put together a 12-page proposal with the original Human Torch character, which which that is a heck of a proposal. If if uh, if uh, the typical submission that Marvel gets is maybe a couple paragraphs written and maybe a couple penciled pages, what happens when you get a lushly painted like 12-page you know, com like basically, is this Marvel Zero or it's is number this one? one. Oh, okay, um, it's a pretty dope comic, and it makes sense now that I think about it. Uh, that 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 was comic was done kind of earlier before it was a Marvel thing because you'll see Clark Kent in that comic. He like the <laughs> reporter and shit like that. What else, man? You got anything? That's all my notes from this article. You know, it, it, again, it just it's it's a perfect summary, I think, of where comics are at this moment. He's the perfect guy for this, and certainly a diligent, hard worker in a unique style. Card games are a thing now, Jimmy, and and Wizard is doing good. So this is an announcement from Wizard Press that Inquest Magazine is forthcoming. And uh, certainly bolstering it all up, man, is, is Magic the Gathering. 
Um, but this will be the second magazine that is very, very successful that we'll be seeing on the newsstands. And then uh, the, to complete the trilogy, eventually will be Toy Fair. It's like those three. Garib Shameless and, Br and his company, man, they did real well. So the Psychic Hawk line, Jimmy, you're not going to make me talk about this, are you, in any way, shape, or form? I took no notes on this. This is another one of those, what are you doing, Wizard Magazine? It's like a they call Latoya Jackson's Psychic Hotline to get rumors of what's coming up in comics. What the, What is this? Very stupid. It's very strange, the stuff Wizard does. Yeah. They're just uncool dudes, you know? They're just super uncool people. Steady as she goes, Billy Tucci, man, talking, talking. She. This was a, this was an article I couldn't wait uh, to sort of come across our coverage because this guy coming out of nowhere has one of the hottest books. It's a color book, and I wanted to know how did this happen. I read the article. I don't get much <laughs> <laughs> from from. Uh, they didn't ask the questions that I needed asked. <laughs> yeah, it's. Pretty spectacular. Like, uh, he describes going in 1993 to Comic Con with samples. And I mean, this Looking is. Looking for a job. In, in 1990. Right, right. Right. No background. This isn't a guy that worked for 10 years in comics and then self published. This is a guy that was trying to break in one year and the next year is self publishing She, which basically hit the ground running. Like, this was. First couple issues didn't sell great numbers, but it certainly connected with fans and took off. What I like about these early issues is um, the the practical coloring. We'll call it if if CGI is is called CGI and you know latex foam is called practical effects. We'll call this practical coloring. And you really didn't see color like this, man. The closest would be like uh, Valiant Comics or something, I guess. Do you think this is markers? I you know I can't tell. That, I can't that's going to be either. a question for him because this is definitely like a wash. Yeah. Right. It's probably mixed media. Probably true. And, and that's, that's good. It, it, it's a pretty impressive package to come out of the gates with. And that might be a function of him not even knowing, like, what are you supposed to use to color a comic? Right. Yeah, his background, um, he has fashion illustration is in his background. And I think that shows uh, in this art. Um, I do too. You know, there's some different approaches to figure depiction and, and clothing and stuff from these. Yeah, and just even, like, she's outfit with this, like, you've seen this fabric, but you've never seen this fabric in a comic. This kind of like puffy mm -hmm. kind of thing. Like, you know what this is. You've seen it and it's never been. Yeah, there's an attention to detail, but it's not the same attention to detail that you're seeing at Wild Storm or at Todd McFarlane. And I think that pays off with comic fans, especially of this era. Um, he also talks about all the different jobs that he's had, including he was the paratrooper. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a military cat. That's pretty, uh, pretty intense. Um, but working all these different jobs, I think, in some ways does prepare you for this type of a, of a career or opportunity where, like, once you know what it is to work, I think when you get a chance to sit at a drawing table, um, you realize, I, I, I don't want to say the word lucky, but, you know, when you know what hard work is, you can apply that to comics making. Yeah, yeah, and you could, you know, also continuously, like, uh, run away from that other stuff by, like... I'm going to fucking make this work yeah, so it, that I don't have to jump out of a plane anymore or whatever. Discipline is obviously super important, if, especially if you're self-employed. And I mean, a paratrooper, I, that, that is a level of discipline and commitment that, again, you can translate it. You don't think of cartoonists as being tough guys necessarily, yeah. but to go through that kind of training is discipline. And, and it's definitely something that you need if you're going to be successful as a self-publisher. Uh, this interview... He mentions teaming up with Palmiotti is coming on board as an anchor. Palmiotti, um, Jimmy Palmiotti, connected to Joe Quesada a lot, but writes a lot, inks a lot, and does a lot of self-publishing. At this time, he's working on Event Comics, his company with Joe Quesada, another startup, um, you know, self-publishing, small press. So I think having those like minds together is a good thing. Yeah, when he starts getting these these other anchors, man, they really take away the rough edges that that I actually like really kind of like liked about his stuff. Sure. He's getting into the variant cover game, man. We see a Silvestri and Bat cover. Did a crossover with Silvestri. Yeah, Sideblade was it? Yeah. And she started out as a movie script, which may have also aided these early issues in that there's a story and characters developed, something that sometimes if you come art first, those things lag behind. I mean, it was the criticism of image for years and years. So if you show up with a developed script, 
it's helpful. He's having um, these Hollywood meetings now. Now that he has this tangible thing, and I think uh, I think that's the era that we're we're getting into with like the success of the mask and you know Dark Horse is doing all that stuff, barbed wire, all of that. Um, not saying Billy Tucci's his cat, but we're gonna get a bunch of guys coming into the game, man, with their fucking movie scripts that they're getting jobbers to illustrate, man, so that they could then turn that property back over. And Tucci's getting Hollywood offers at this point, man, but he's like, I don't want to do some direct uh, to video stuff, which that's a term that uh, is rooted in a time period. Um, yeah, now that would be on demand, right? Yeah, yeah, like one of those Netflix things. Or something. Netflix, man. Those Netflix originals, garbage. That, that's about all I got for, for uh, yeah, Tucci. Yeah, that's all I have. It's a short article. It's just two pages of text. He's, a, he's at conventions and stuff, man, and I, I would like to sit with him and get like... I just ask him the real questions about like starting all that stuff up, man, uh, and talk numbers, man. What did it cost initially? Who were your distributors? Like, what was the tipping point? That's I'm, the, I'm that's with the you questions 100%. to fucking ask these 100%. fucking douchebags at, at Wizard, man. They don't know shit. What we're not covering casting that. calls too. I think I'm gonna go to the restroom now, Ed. <laughs> A New Hope, Dark Horse Leaves, its mark on the Star Wars legacy. Um, one thing that's mentioned, kind of buried in there, is that George Lucas is is working to do new Star Wars pictures. So I guess that that, that must have been released uh, this early. I feel like he's been working on new Star Wars pictures since uh, 1980. When was the last one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he just needed that toy uh, license to lapse so that he could uh, jump into the game and make all the money renegotiate those terms because i think we're five year five and a half years out from the next star wars movie four and a half years out at the time of this article yeah um so dark empire 2 these uh I'm, yeah I'm, i would bet that you haven't read many of the star wars comics you Jim. bet right yeah i have uh one of my closest homeboys uh collected this stuff it's a big star wars mark uh always interesting when I would come across an issue that would have like Jim Woodring art or something like that. So they would get cool people every now and again, do little one shots and junk. I like Cam Ken. This is Cam Kennedy on the left there. I, I like his art and I like the art that I've seen from these Star Wars comics. I yeah. Thought he looked good. They had a couple big hits, man. So this is the expanded universe. In that time where George Lucas is futzing around with bullshit, uh, there was still a want and a need for these stories, man. Uh, the thing that separated them, well, I don't know this, but I've heard this, that uh, that separates Star Wars from Star Trek is the, the, the sort of tight dedication to continuity um, was kind of important to the overall thing. So there would be like the Star Wars comics that are from a million years ago, the all the old shit. Um, there, there's like Dark Empire. That was like an outlier of something that people cite as like wanting that to be canon. And that's the one where Luke Skywalker. That and that's Cam Kennedy. Tom Veach wrote that. Was that based on a novel? There were a couple of novels that that I think were connected to all of this stuff too. Yeah, might have been man. Like like that one and uh, Shadows of the Empire. Those are like the two popular ones that that yielded toys and stuff like that. Note on the Star Trek stuff because I don't have a lot of notes on this. I'm not a big Star Trek person um but my note is cam kennedy says lucas hasn't rejected anything yet in contrast with stories we saw about star trek that we've seen reported in wizard from peter david's nightmare experiences but but to others that had that license and had issues with star trek so you're, you're definitely right that does seem to be a very different approach between those two camps it's a reminder to me going through this stuff how much licensing was a big part of comics that's it's not always something i think about i mean i'm aware of lots of these licenses sure. robocop and aliens and everything but like all the companies had some version you know malibu had star the star trek license for a while so that was a part of the business strategy of all these comics companies and I guess maybe they were sold or sold better outside of the direct market, you know, and, and maybe that was part of how you would float your companies too, is you would have the license, but then you would have some outlet where you could sell these things, Suncoast Video or something. You know, I, I'm making that one up. I sure. don't know the workings, but it seems like they weren't the big sellers in the direct market, but they must have been profitable enough to pay a licensing fee on top of the production fees and still make it work. So. I, you know, it's interesting to me that they all have that. They all have a wing of it. Even Marvel has that wing. Yep.
drawing board, the the uh, the winners are starting to get cool stuff, man. And this dude's going to get a pretty nice Mike Allred illustration, and that and that's the contest, man. Got to yeah. do got to do uh, your uh, your Madman costume. Yeah, these are these are pretty fun. I like when there's a little bit of a theme. It gives you some direction. Uh, flipping through these, how cool is this? Different. How cool is this Chris Meesey thing, man? That's an outlaw comic right there. There are several of these that I think turn out pretty well. Interesting, Mike Allred has this kind of juice at this stage because Madman's not a hit yet, or you know, Mike Allred certainly is not a mainstream. What what we know him as today, he was not back then. Like wanna, Madman was an alternative comic. I want to point out this one right here about a homie, Kari yes. Andrews, man. Gone who, on to do a lot of comics work. Yeah, yeah. He's like the other guy at Marvel who writes, draws, colors, inks and stuff. And he's a he's a director. Like, he was telling this story, man, uh, when he was directing some show. I don't know the name of the show, but it has, like, uh, some sci-fi elements, some, some special effect elements. And uh, th- it required, like, like, a gauntlet, like a special cool glove. And, like, the makeup department, like, whoever d- makes the tchotchkes, like, they just weren't getting it. So he's like puts the pa- piece of paper down and fucking like draws the thing up like make this yes you know that's yeah he's fresh. an interesting artist because he's gone through all kinds of media he was doing marvel comics that didn't look like marvel comics uh very interesting in that regard you know what's great about this contest is all these comments are by mike allred so he's breaking down what he sees in this particular illustration that he likes or doesn't like that's always great. Like getting any of like words from the artist to me is always huge. And to see like a bunch of costume design and then have Mike Allred weigh in on what makes a good costume or what makes this costume or that costume work. Yeah. That's pretty good stuff. Yeah. Super fun. Like that's a brutes and babes in a way where you're really getting into the, the thought process that Mike Allred brings to designing a costume and a character. Cut and print comic insiders guide to Hollywood, man. Sharper image on TV. I have a couple of pieces from this. One of them is Concrete. Paul Chadwick is writing a script for Concrete. This was always in development, I swear, as long as I've been reading comics and following comics. I like Concrete a lot. Uh, Interesting character. Surprised it never made it to the screen. It kind of shows how much of a crapshoot it is, like what actually gets made and what doesn't. Because in my mind, there's no reason Concrete can't exist. It's interesting stories. Visually, it seems like that would be... It's a real world with just one outstanding character. It wouldn't be that hard to make. But for one reason or another, it's, it hasn't happened. Yeah, yeah. It's it's there, you know, amongst the long list of potential Hollywood hits, man, that, that uh, have been an option status for a million years, man. Um, ElfQuest, mm. Nexus. Like, yeah. we, could, we could go down the list. I mean, Harvey Pekar's American Splendor was that for about 20 years until it finally got its its due, and uh, you know, from Harvey's mouth, man, um, sometimes it's best. Like the American Splendor flick is dope, but for your own personal bottom line, now, now there's no more option money, and and Harvey was getting like a hundred hundred racks a year. That's interesting. Twenty something years, man, and then he got a hundred racks for uh for American Splendor, and then no more no more loot. Now it's now it's like you're gonna get better book deals. Instead of just this free yeah. 100 Gs. And then that's the other big news. MTV to the max. Yes, it tested well. What it was going to be, like, there was MTV oddities. And it was going to be, you know, 15 minutes of the max, 15 minutes of the head, which was a very cool uh, cartoon. Tested well, and they decided that they'll do, like, six episodes and just have two max segments for, in a half-hour block. Um, you know, Savage Dragon cartoon is coming. We saw Wildcats right before Spawn. They're talking about going to uh, going to HBO probably. It's not not. I don't think it's it's signed, sealed, and delivered. But that's the word on the street. This two year old company man has a bunch of stuff out there in Hollywood. Here's the fascinating part of all the properties you just named. Max is the last one to publication and the first one to broadcast. Ah, that's that is fascinating. That's a quick turnaround. Like like when did Max start? You know, like it wasn't the first wave of Image Comics. And here we are. It's up and running. This isn't like a deal is in the works. It's like we're done. Like we've got it figured out. It's coming to MTV now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super good call, man. Um, another comic that was in kind of like development, purgatory forever, Zen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it fits that profile. You know, there's as you said, there's a list of them. 
The Max is exciting, though. I'm, I'm eager to, to see that move forward because it was such an odd adaptation in that it was extremely faithful to the comic. Like, yeah. lifting images and compositions, and it was a weird storyline to begin with. So Pretty that'll be a fun one to, uh, to, to revisit and get into as we see it start to actually air. Jimmy, are you going to make me go through this article, Clothes Make the Man, about Batman's weird gimmick costumes? I don't even have that listed in my notes, Ed. Good, I'm glad. <laughs> Let's talk Keith, Keith Giffen, man. Crossing the line. Candid chat with Keith Giffen. He talks about the ups and downs of his career, pushing the envelope, and the one character he wants to get his hands on, man. So there were like the old Defender comics that we saw that Keith, Kif, Keith Giffen drew with the steeped in Kirby kind of art, man. And he gives a story here about like trying to crack into the comic biz, man, and finally makes a little bit of headway, but it's like super unreliable, fucks up deadlines, and basically uh, the the term now that the kids use is ghost. He ghosted on like Joe Orlando and a bunch of dudes. He just like got a job and didn't turn it in and didn't like let them know. It was just like I can't do it. Like, yeah, it's in, it, 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 it's. I, I never knew this story before. No. It's, it's fascinating. I don't think we've heard a story like this before in comics. I mean, obviously, people mess up. The story that you would hear, like, in, like, when I was going to art school and stuff, and you have these, like, grizzled vets talking, they would all say, you have one shot. If you welch out and you cause a publisher to be late that has time booked on a print machine, and they have to eat the cost of that, you don't get to work in comics anymore. Right. That's the story that we would get. Yeah, so this is a pretty... But you don't get it from, like, this is my origin story as a pro. Not I did all. this, and now I, and then I came back. That's so unusual. I guess it probably has happened, but not the comeback. Like, probably guys have flaked out, done whatever. Um, we know... I know guys. There were Pittsburgh dudes who are amazing artists who would draw true. us under the table, but they didn't make that deadline, and now they're the pothead chilling on the couch. Yeah, good point. So, interesting what he comes back from. Uh, in that regard, because it is a pretty unusual origin story for a comic book artist. He goes off and he works on the portfolio some more. I guess he felt like you know he felt some sort of insecurity, something. But it speaks volumes of the it speaks volumes of the work of the portfolio. It speaks volumes of the man that Joe Orlando is, who said, "Come on in, kid. Let's talk about it." You know, they had the conversations and uh, they hooked him up in a prob probationary period, man. And uh, one of those probationary things, you're going to have to draw some of those, like, fifth-tier DC Weird War Tales of Western House of Secrets type shit. And then maybe we'll fold you into some real stuff, man. He calls out Hex. I think, like, the end of one of the Hex series is something he got a few issues in. It was one of those, like, this is not a top-selling book at all. And, uh, and I know some kayfabers that love that run. It's kind of a sci-fi version of Hex. Um, so, I don't know if irony is quite the right word, but some some people out there appreciate those issues. He 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 he. You know, he's a he's an enhancement talent for a little bit on these little bullshits, man. But then he gets that chance to to work on uh, Legion of Superheroes, which is like a coveted run, man. Show some of these bitches off. Yeah, go ahead. I brought a couple of these just to f kind of flip through. I think his art's very attractive. Um, one piece that's in this, I'm surprised, but it's in this article, is he was he was lifting like uh, Jose Munoz, yeah, who did Alex Sinner uh, comics. I think Argentinian. Um, I don't know, but but a, a very attractive artist uh, art style, and he got called out. I think the Comics Journal may have called him out for picking up compositions, copying compositions from Jose Munoz, and he says it was uh, it hurt his career. This is a little before... You know what? Amazing Heroes is where I may have seen an article about it. Um, I don't know. Like, every cartoonist I know sort of lifts and picks stuff up, so I'm surprised that it, it had that effect, but apparently it was pretty egregious. Like, he was really lifting panels. Yeah, yeah. Like, drawing, like, one for one, like, keeping all the strokes in there, uh, which which actually, like, to me, still, I'm, I'm just like, wh who cares? Like, comics is still based on that, but you might not remember this, man. When we were um, going to Ides do at their, like, little J uh, April sale or whatever... Uh, one of those, uh, one of those guys, man, who, who runs the comic part, like he like pulled me over to him to like show me these yeah, Keith Giffen uh, swipes and like yes. look at what Giffen did, and it was because I pulled uh, one of the um, comics where he did he pulled some of the Munio stuff, and and he's he's showing it to me like it's like it's this grave crime, 
And I'm like, whatever. His stuff looks pretty unique this to me. This is dope. Yeah, for sure. Definitely has a visual style at this point that doesn't look like other comics. And there are devout Giffen fans. Fife. Yeah, yeah well, Michelle Fife, <laughs> man. Saying hi to you. Shouts, homie. And there's devoted Legion of Superhero fans. Of course, he introduces the Lobo character in Legion of Superheroes, um, which will... Uh, it's a much different character than, than he fleshed out later on. Yeah, and, and he seems like... Uh, he describes Lobo as reprehensible and says he doesn't like him, even though I think... That means, like, in the context of the character being successful. I think he likes working on him because he's, he's a nuts character. But he's so different than what you think of as superhero comics or comics for everybody to read. Lobo just... I think everybody... A lot of older people had this reaction to Lobo, and it's you're repulsed that it exists and that it's popular. <laughs> but Giffen did a lot of this kind of tongue-in-cheek work. So, like, this is the heckler, which he describes in this article as is uh, patterned after Bugs Bunny to give you some idea of, like, the sensibility that he was bringing to comics was certainly different than what you were seeing everywhere. And I think Lobo fits that as well, where it's, like, it's tongue-in-cheek and it's lampooning some of the violent characters, but it's going so far across the line. Whenever that character takes off, I think he was shocked by it. All right. <laughs> and uh, he talks about in the article, man, the drop-off from the units sold from Heckler number one to issue two, an Empire State Building uh, size <laughs> gulf. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> between the two, man, big yeah. loss. Cult, cult books for sure. Some of these, which again might be part of the reason you look around and go, "Well, I hate Lobo," because that one's the one that's selling. But meanwhile, it's the one that maybe is your least connection to the material and the kind of stories that you're telling in that. Yeah, Ambush Bug was a popular one. I think that comes before Heckler. This is the Christmas special of Ambush Bug, and I think it really shows off his creativity. I picked this up recently. Um, you know, Keith Giffen's not a guy I read as a kid outside of Lobo. Yeah. But because we hear so much about how great he is, I've been picking them up when I see them. And uh, this was one of the ones that stood out to me because it is all over the map of what is happening in this comic. Very, very interesting. And I think that sums up Keith Giffen. Like, we've shown off Trencher, um, which I don't know that it's mentioned in this it's profile. Not. It's not. Um, Trencher's one that I feel fondly about because it was another one that I read, but also graphically it had a look unlike any other comic, which I, you know, I celebrate. That's the stuff I look for. And you see some of that in this Ambush Bug Christmas special where he is bouncing all over the place with ideas and energy and visuals. Like at one point it's how to write comics. Doesn't this feel like Shaky Kane? Like this it does, and it this? totally. And, and it, it may have been. It would have been a time period whenever Shaky Kane and Deadline would have been around. So... I do think he's looking at everything. You know, Sinner was not... Um, Alex Sinner, Jose Munoz, it's not like that was a top-selling book that you were going to find. Like like Sugar right. and Spike. Yeah, there's references and homages, and I think he's probably a guy who loved comics and was looking at a lot of different stuff, and you can see it in his style. You know, it doesn't look like your typical comic. Yeah, this is a fun-looking issue here. Was he involved in the um, that Grant Morrison Doom Patrol... Uh, weird image thing. Was that Keith Giffen? I, I don't know that, Jimmy. This is a guy who's a kind of a blind spot for me in a lot of ways, too. Yeah, me too. I, I certainly have just barely started to scratch the surface on him. You know, fairly prolific cartoonist, so he has a big body of work out there. Yeah. Um, like I said, Lobo is really my my Giffen uh, entry point, and maybe it's atypical of a lot of his work. But I do love the team-up. He was doing layouts on those Lobo comics that... Um, Bisley was drawing, mm -hmm. and I thought it worked for both of them. Yeah. I thought it looked really good in terms of Bisley art, and I think the layouts helped a lot for that reason. So, like, the clickbait kind of article, I like the, the, the title, you know, what character he wants to get his hands on. Captain America is a guy. So, just for the people, yeah, I read that, mm, and I'll right. give you the answer. Captain America is it's a character so that he would like I didn't like even to... make a note of that, like, right. who cares? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder if he did any Captain America. I mean, it's been 20, 20 plus years now. Fife. Put a comment, man. Moonshot. It's so frustrating to me because if you look at this cover, I love that art. Uh -huh. I think that looks amazing. Really cool, great letter, color and lighting. And then as soon as you see the logo top part, it's just like, oh, it yeah. makes me sick. Yeah, make note of that, young makers out there. This is a, based on a true story, um, kind of a science comic. You know, you, you see these things pop up now more and more with graphic novels they even talk about selling them in museums. This is based on Apollo 12's mission, and it's um, 
published the editor in chief of this company. It's startup just to publish this comic book, but they plan to do more of these types of comics is the wife of Captain Charles Pete Conrad Jr., who was the astronaut on of Apollo 12, still with us at the time of this writing. And so all, all three astronauts from this mission are alive at this time, and they talk about passing this comic past them, you know, to, to make sure it's sound uh, scientifically. And so they developed this idea to tell this story. Nobody was interested in publishing it, decided to self-publish it. It's kind of it's it's on my list now. Something I'm half looking for and curious to see. Yeah, it's it's something uh, ahead of its time because if they want to be you know the culture vultures of 2019, man, they would get a New York book deal in a second. They mentioned that uh, different different people that are interested in this book now that it's available, and one thing they talk about is getting involved in CD-ROM. Yeah, Billy, Billy Tucci, Tucci was also talking about that it. too. It's so weird. Like, is CD-ROM something than other other than just storage it, like it would be it would be like pdfs of the comic or or as you know it sometimes it would be like motion comics where they would chop it up in like flash you know and 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 have like you know advance an image or it's such a bit of like jargon the way it's dropped in these conversations of like yeah it's some people from cd-rom <laughs> right <hit> me up <laughs> yeah like we'll, we'll see like even there's all this like like the computer is i mean we're going to be entering windows 95 era you know what I'm saying, man? So there's going to be a, a big changes technologically. And there are comic book ads in here that, I mean, uh, uh, video game ads in here where it's talking like one of the promotional pieces selling you on the uh, on the video game is that it's 32 megs of ra- like it's the storage space. The, the amount right. of data required to make the game is a lot. So there's all this like they're taking advantage that n- new people are getting into computers and don't know what the fuck any of that is, man. <laughs> they're taking advantage, but also like half the people talking have been oh, they taking don't know advantage shit. of. Yeah, they don't know <laughs> they shit. Know what they're saying. Yeah. <laughs> I should cut right here to uh, that one senator who's talking about like, the internet is not a truck. It's a pile of tubes. And I sent the internet on a Friday. I didn't get it until Monday. <laughs> Please do. They, 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 they deliver in other ways, but they want to deliver vast amounts of information over the Internet. And again, the Internet is not something that you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's, it's a series of tubes. And if you don't understand, those tubes can be filled. And if they're filled, when you put your message in, it gets in line. It's going to be delayed by anyone that puts into that tube enormous amounts of material. That's a classic piece, man. Toying around, man. Sean on. New superhero figures, dude. Batman Returns. Take two. So it's like Batman Returns, but... Oh, I see. It's uh, Batman Animated Series figures, dude. New wave of that. And they're including Bane. Tick figures. I'm much more excited by the Tick figures than the Batman figures. So good, man. Deflator Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> we had these. A couple of these gimmicks, man. I'm always a fan of a bullet-headed superhero for some reason, man. That's a classic trope of the American comic. Fawcett... There's been some black and white boom characters who had that. It's yeah, you, you've uh, you, you've called that out before and passed mailbags. So, I've, uh... I've, uh, <laughs> I've, I've 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 had many of my own bullet-headed uh, superheroes as a boy. Homemade heroes always looking great, except look at that grunge, <laughs> that Play-Doh hair. Palmer's picks a comic book cocktail. We're talking. Uh, is it called Very Vicky? Very Vicky. Yeah, Jimmy, I don't know anything about it. I've never read this either. It is a 16-year-old is the main character, and there's a fair amount of drinking that goes on in this comic, according to uh, the the column here. Like a real 16-year-old? Um, self-published. It seems like it exists outside of most of the comics world that we know and love, um, in that the creators, you know, they, they seem to be interested in making this comic, but it doesn't seem like it's mainstreamed in any way. Mm-hmm. Um I will pick up a Very Vicky if I come across one in the future. This, yeah. this article has piqued my attention. It is one that I have seen before, but I've never read an issue. Uh, I would not have guessed this was a teenage girl, judging by the artwork that you see here. Um, so, who knows? One of their recommended readings stood out to me, though, and that's Fat Man and the Human Flying Saucer by C.C. C. Beck. I don't think we're going to see that one called out in, a few, in any other Palmer's <laughs> picks. And you know what? If I come across any Very Vickies for a quarter... 
I'll get them and give them to you. I just realized, like, now I'm nervous that I said this on screen that we're going to end up with a mailbag full of <laughs> very don't, Vickies. Don't say we. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's doubles. I guess Tom could use some very <laughs> Vickies. Keep it rocking. Yeah. Comic Watch, Ms. Marvel 16, first appearance of Mystique. I actually have that comic. And uh, it, was a, it was a friend who studied Wizard like it was a sacred tablet, who was like, hey, Ed, man, this is the first appearance of Mystique comic you got. <laughs> and uh, Wonder Woman, Volume 1, number 300. It's the first appearance of, of Lita Hall, who's going to be the father of young Daniel, who's, who's proving to be very important in the canon of Sandman comics. Yeah, I feel like the people who love Sandman aren't sort of speculating back and yeah. <laughs> picking up the, uh, the, the the first appearance of future Sandman's mother. <laughs> Picks from the wizard's hat, man. Extreme sacrifice, boy. The shake-ups, man, over there at Rob Liefeld's joint. And uh, there, we have the prelude right here that we'll show off, dude. Extreme sacrifice play, prelude. Those are big dudes on the cover, man. Yes, and... Uh, I wanted to highlight this piece here. That's a ridiculous cover, by the way, with like that, that star pattern or whatever the white is supposed to be in the background. Just put stars in the back and it'll like kind of look okay. <laughs> kind of. Kind of is, right, <laughs> is the right word. So, so uh, one, of, one of the tenets of creating a cartoonist kayfabe channel was we weren't going to do any clickbait nonsense of like, of like Rob Liefeld, bad uh, yeah. drawings and like shit like that. I see a lot of feet. And... It's funny you should mention that. Hold your thought. Um, and whenever I see these things, these these popular... Because people send these shits to me. And when they choose, like, the bad art, all low-hanging fruit. Number one is always Captain America with the titties. Um, you know, there's always the swipe with Ronin, with Shatterstar. All of that, man. This is actually my favorite uh, piece piece of bad art like like this this cover there's like one thing in particular like with this this cover taught me a lesson jim and uh it's a lesson that stick, stuck with, with me to this day and i got it from this because this is a cover created by a guy with youthful energy he's still he's still this kind of a kid and he made a fucking childish mistake that a young artist does when they're first getting into the game and it's very simple because it has to do with feet it has to do with this foot right here. And I think that I could project and reverse engineer what happened. <laughs> he drew Shaft and was very happy with that Shaft figure. And then he drew Prophet. And he worked his way down. And that foot came down way further. <laughs> but he would put a lot of work in already, man. And he wasn't going to erase that shit. So we have this weird thing, man, with this, like, everybody else is in spa is proper space and behind one another, but Shaft is standing on him, and that is what Rob did. He just loved this too much and wouldn't erase it or redraw it or wouldn't erase him. So what it taught me was, comp it's a compositional, it's block out everybody first. Get it all to look the way you want it to before you really get in there with the nuts and bolts and, and you start... You start drawing all the little de details and shit. But it's, this cover taught me that. It's funny that that's what you point out, because I think there are a few stumbles yeah. <laughs> visible on this cover. I was looking at the way their arms, we talk about tangents, not having certain lines overlap or run parallel to each other. Yeah. And their arms are exactly that. Like, it's so confusing. I was looking at this as you were talking, and I'm like, what kind of, what knife is the shaft holding there? And you realize his arm is exactly in front of Prophet's arm. Sure. Sure. Baby steps. Yeah. You, you learn small things as you go, man. That all said, I'm happy with this cover and that Liefeld's inking himself Me on too. it. Me too. And this is, you know, like, I always like his work better when he inks himself. Me too. And uh, this is not, I think he might do another Extreme Sacrifice cover, maybe an issue two or a zero or something like that. That would that, be that the I last one. might like better than this one. Um, and I, I wonder, like, is that part of it? Because this is like... This is would be an ad. And this was cool too, because because like it's the same implements, but he would this was speedy. This was like a speedy illustration. Uh -huh. And uh I, I like the blood strike a lot. Like the the weird head proportion is, is kind of neat on it. You should see the prophet that's over here, because he was getting back into that Liefeld from like the X Force where yeah. he would do those like crosshatch 
or like those hatch lines where the eyes are, and it was this very odd, like what? I know what exactly are you telling what me? you're describing. So, yeah, so so profit <laughs> would be that, like those weird eyes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's using like a flare pen or something, and I quite like it. And also, uh, I like that the veins like protrude, like like protrude from. He's the upping contour. his vein game. Yeah, X Files One is coming out. Um, Scoop it up. Yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be a hit book of the mid '90s, man. There was there was a real there's a real void in anything that could uh, even be mistaken for a good comic in those mid 1990s and it seems like people really like that i've, n- I've never looked in an issue so i, I can't it's not bad it. i bought a batch of them for a friend's kid uh not too long ago who loves x files but x files was just so popular yeah you know like that maybe mid to late 90s x files was so popular i think it was right place right time and i think they would package them as like digests that were sold in supermarkets even interesting where it'd be like maybe two three issues in it and collected in one digest I think that's right, you know, and they were sold in places where people could find them. So for one reason or another, that series ran for, man, 30, 40 issues, which would have been the bleak 90s comics publishing time period. Yeah. Top 10 comics, Bad Girls, The One Lone Patrick Daniel O'Neill Choice, (laughs) and Wonder Woman 88, Christopher, Christopher Priest on the writing duties. Not sure why it's here. They say it's like, uh, still some sort of a bad girl thing like that's the reason but whatever generation x1 hits hits the hits the charts as well usurping spawn for like probably the first time in a hot minute man uh some of the x books x-men alpha one that's the one that requires like three droppers to write the whole thing um x-men 41 and uncanny x-men 321 deluxe edition are uh, in the top three spots there. <laughs> Todd McFarlane's ego column, strike two. And uh, he's he's got a little extra time on his hands, man, even though he's you know running a comics empire and running a toy empire because there's a baseball strike going on and a hockey strike. He's quite upset about it, man. More so about the hockey. He's a baseball player, but would rather play it than watch it. Uh, but the hockey, the hockey one hurts, man. He talks about revenue sharing in this article and quite frankly this comes off as ludicrous to me Mm -hmm. um his idea is that revenue sharing either it can't work or it shouldn't work or whatever and i think he i think he's he's way off on most of this Mm -hmm. the problem with revenue sharing is that a lot of these different if you're the new york yankees you have a much larger television contract than everybody else la dodgers gigantic you know it's it's a huge disadvantage so revenue sharing happens in a lot of sports and it seems like it works in those sports. So I think he's probably off on some of these ideas. Um, I don't know. I think this is a frustrated sports fan. More power to Todd McFarlane that he can use this platform to write about whatever he wants to. Yeah. But it's a strange piece in a strange magazine. Yeah. There's not one mention of a comic book anything. And there's not even like a metaphor or like he's not pointing to anything. Right. He's not looking at it where you might line up like sports athletes as being sort of the equivalent of the talent at Marvel. Yeah. And then like the ownership being, you know, the, the corporate owners or whatever. It's not even framed in that way because that's what you end up, what a lot of these strikes fight over is the percentage of revenue that players are entitled to. And, you know, it's like everything else. You're fighting over a couple of percent somewhere in the middle of that 50, 50 split. And, uh, I don't know. Like, I don't know that there's any relevance to comics here, except that a very, very successful cartoonist is upset that the sport he likes to watch (laughs) is not on television. The article is called Ego. Everyone's got opinions. Uh, And and basically the one thing that could be applied to comics is if you're in a talent, it's okay to ask for a race and it's okay for you to get it or not, depending on your market value. And we end with a wizard profile uh, highlighting uh, Diana Schutz. Uh, to me, this is uh, the second... They're, they're on a streak. Two good profiles with people that uh, deserve some attention. Uh, last issue being Will Eisner. This issue being Diana, Diana Schutz, who is um, often mentioned in very glowing light from the talent who has worked uh, with her on their own books, Matt Wagner being a big uh, one of those guys, man. So it's cool to... to See her get a little bit of shine here, man. She worked at a comic shop in the 70s. Um, yeah, left grad school to work in a comic shop. It's a different career path. I agree. Uh, she's, I think at the time of this profile, is editor-in-chief at Dark Horse Comics. Yeah. 
did a stint in Kamiko. So she's pretty well versed in like, I'm going to say independent comics, but you know, outside of that, again, Marvel, DC, corporate owned work for hire she, she, structure. She, yeah, she, she wrote articles for Amazing Heroes, Comics Journal. You would see her name all over the place, man. And she'd be a fun one to talk to because certainly connection to comics history. Like she was there for some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Working in a comic shop in the seventies. Have you, did you ever see a girl? (laughs) That's true. Did you ever see another girl in a shop, man? That wasn't dragged in there by the boyfriend who, who wasn't like going like this with her watch. Yes. Um, she was at SPX one time when we were there. Super nice lady, man. So I think that she is approachable. I think we might be able to, to, to work something out, man. Yeah, the person that she'd like to work with is Frank Miller, which confused me a little bit because, like, Miller's doing Sin City at Dark Horse at this time. She must have some connection there if she wants it, and, right? And and maybe it doesn't say who you'd most like to work with who you haven't, because I swear I see her names on his books. And one of the people who I hear speak glowingly of her would be Frank Miller. Yeah. So it, if it hasn't happened, it's going to happen very soon, I think. Uh, obviously, she's... Now, now I closely associate her with Bob Shrek. Right. So uh, I know, and I know Bob Shrek is oftentimes the editor for, for Frank Miller, but I'm sure she's in there somewhere. Got our ad for Todd Toys here, man, with the three of six figures that exist in that first wave. That's like the gummy, the Gumby, uh, you know, the the little rubber thing that you could bend and manipulate uh, Violator's position. Kind of looks like... Uh... The Mr. Show sketch where the guy tried to commit suicide and, like, burn his body all up. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> Still called Todd Toys. Mm. And we get the heck out of here, man, with that Birthquake uh, advertisement. Gearing up for Wizard Magazine 43. Yes, man. Star Trek Comics. Next Generation and Voyager. Something tells me that there were probably more exciting and enticing uh, things, features to get you in there on the poly bag that this thing came packed in. <laughs> I bet you're right about that. Because I bought this one and I definitely didn't buy it for Star Trek comics. Really? They're in bold, man. <laughs> <laughs> K-Fabers, like, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can let you know when the next vids are available. You can find Cartoonist k merch and t-shirts at the link below. Jim, I only have 11 issues of She, so I'm going to go off and read them, (laughs) and I'm going to tell the kayfabers to do something similar. Read more comics.